Okay, I, first of all, I'm a, I apologize for giving this talk in English, uh, but it's much easier for me, ex especially at, um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, when I usually don't get up until afternoon. So if, if, uh, if I'm speaking too fastly, just, just tell me to slow down. And also with this talk, uh, I know everyone here has different backgrounds. So if you don't, if something is too uh, detailed and you want a simpler explanation, just ask me. Or if you want some more detail, just ask me as well. Because uh, this is going to mostly be a... Uh, well, some people here are geochemists, some are geophysicists, some are uh, biologists, so it's, uh, it's hard to make a, a talk comprehensible to everyone. So what I'm going to do today is talk about science for several reasons. Uh, the first is that the, moon, the origin of the moon and Earth are intimately related, as I will show. So if you want to understand how the Earth formed, you really have to take into account how the moon formed as well. Also, if you're interested in, in exobiology, uh, it's quite likely that there are samples of the ancient Earth on the moon's surface. These are just meteorites from the Earth which landed on the moon. And it's quite possible that some of these rocks are older than the oldest rocks that we have available to study on Earth. Of, of course, we, we haven't found any yet, but if we go back to the moon, we will have more samples, and perhaps we will be able to find some. Um, also, in terms of impact processes, the moon is probably the best place in the solar system to study impact craters because we have pristine examples of, of impact craters from kilometers in size to hundreds of kilometers in size. Also, if you're interested in volatiles, as I'll show later, it's quite possible that there are uh, deposits of ice near the, near the poles of the moon, and it's possible that these deposits were in, in place uh, billions of years ago. <clears throat> so this would be a unique aspect to, um, to study volatiles in our, in our solar system. Um, and finally, if you're inter interested in human exploration of the solar system, it most likely we're, this is going to start at the moon. Uh, the American plan for sending humans into space is to first go to the moon and then to go to Mars afterwards. And also, um, as I'll briefly mention later, uh, the majority of space missions in the next decade are actually going to be going to the moon. So in the next, uh, well, actually there's two missions in orbit around the moon now. In the next year or two, there will be two more launched, and in a couple years after that, several more. So there's much that's going to be, a, there's going to be a lot of lunar data available to the public in, in the next couple of years. <clears throat> okay, so this is just briefly the, the overview of this talk. Uh, it's going to be divided into five parts. If I don't have time, I'll skip the last one. But the first part, I'd like to talk about the origin and uh, early differentiation of the moon. Secondly, I'd talk about what geophysics has to offer us in terms of studying the internal structure of the moon. Uh, thirdly, I'd like to talk about the impact craters, just the processes and what craters look like on the moon. And then after that, show how we can actually use craters to date the surfaces of planets. And if I have time, I'll talk about the, the evidence for ice at near the poles of the moon. <clears throat> okay, so the first part is just the origin and differentiation of the moon. Um, you will hear more about the origin of the, the of, of the planets uh, in the talk later this afternoon. So just, I'm just going to go through the, the early part of this very, very briefly. But the idea is that you start with a, with a nebular cloud, which collapses uh, into, into an accretion disk such as this. And over about a million years or so, these dust particles uh, stick together or accumulate gravitationally, forming asteroidal-sized particle uh, objects, which are about you know, tens of kilometers to 100 kilometers in diameter. Over another million years or so, these, these asteroids accrete into larger objects called planetary embryos. These are things that are roughly the size of the moon or Mars, so it's about a thousand kilometer diameter object. And then over the next uh, 100 million years or so, these objects collide uh, and, and form larger objects, uh, forming the planets that we see today. And this is just a very short animation showing this process, and maybe you'll see this again this afternoon. <laughs> Um, but in essence, what this shows is the mass of objects in the solar system versus distance from the sun. So here's, here's where the Earth should be located. And the simulation starts out with uh, hundreds of asteroidal-sized objects, and then about 10 those who don't know what, the, what, what plagioclase is. It's just a calcium aluminum sil silicate. Uh, this is important because uh, the, the, most of the moon's aluminum in the, in, in the moon is sequestered into these types of rocks uh, in the crust. But these, these rocks have very old ages. They're, they're, they've been dated to be about four and a half billion years, which just pretty much dates the, the origin of the moon. Uh, these represent the, are believed to represent the primary flotation crust during the crystallization of a magma ocean. And it's also important to realize that there's really no other way to form these anorthosites in large quantities. On the Earth, there are some places where we have 
abundant, where we have anorthosites visible at the surface, but they're very rare. And as I'll show in a second, that the entire lunar surface is pretty much composed of anorthosites. So the only way that geochemists know how to form this rock in any significant abundance is by the fractional crystallization of a magma ocean. So what do we know about the distribution of anorthosites? Well, this here is showing a, a picture, was well, an image of the abundance of iron on the lunar surface. In essence, this is, a, this is a map that was obtained from the Clementine mission, which was sent to the moon in 1994, and they took, uh, spec they took uh, multispectral images of the lunar surface, and from the spectra, it's, it's possible to make estimates of the abundance of iron on the lunar surface. And what, what I want to point out is that, well, first of all, I should mention that anorthosite, as I showed the chemical formula before, has no iron in it. So wherever we see low abundances of iron on the lunar surface, it's, this is most likely representative of the rock anorthosite. So everywhere where you see these kind of blue and purplish colors, all around here and all over here, these, are, these regions of the moon are probably composed of the, of mineral, of the mineral anorthite. So this suggests that roughly 80% of the moon's crust or so is composed of, this, of, this, of anorthosites. Um, this region here with high abundances of, of iron, this, this is just the Mare de Salts. These are lava flows which have high abundances of iron. I'll talk about these more in a second. Okay, a second type of rock that was collected on the moon's surface are collectively referred to as the magnesium sweet rocks. Um, these are a bit different than the anorthosites in that they're intrusive crustal rocks. They're composed of various abundances of, of plagioclase, pyroxene, and olivine. So just an example, this rock here is a troctolite, which is mostly uh, a mixture of, of plagioclase and olivine. These rocks, uh, some of them are very old. They date from the origin of the moon about 4.5 billion years ago. But some of them are also very young. Or not, well, by relative standards, they're young. They're, the youngest one is about 3.8 billion years old. So this shows that the moon was volcanically active and that there was some kind of processes, uh, magmatic processes leading to plutonism in the lunar crust that operated for roughly a billion years or so. Um, also, what's important is that these rocks uh, contain high abundances of creep or they're known to be petrogenically related to creep. So these rocks here are somehow related to, to this, um, the last remaining uh, liquids that crystallize from the magma ocean. So what do we know about the spatial distribution of the magnesium sweet rocks? Um, this here is showing a, a, a map obtained from the Lunar Prospector gamma ray spectrometer showing the abundance of thorium on the moon's surface. And thorium is important because thorium is one of these rare elements. So whenever you see high abundances of thorium on the moon's surface, that means there is most likely high abundances of creep as well. And what this shows is that most of the moon's surface has very, very low abundances of thorium. So it's just like 1 ppm or so in the highlands. But there's this one region on the near side of the moon which has very, very high abundances of thorium going up about 15 ppm or so. So this is somewhat surprising. This, this, what this suggests is that these magnesium sweet rocks and this geochemical component called creep, somehow they, they all became sequestered in this one near side province on, on the moon, in this one small region, which only encompasses about 16% of the moon's surface area. And as I'll show in a second, this is important because this is where all, all the moon's heat production is, gen is, is located. So all the thorium and uranium and potassium, these are elements which decay and give off heat. They're all located in this region. Okay, the next uh, type of rock that was collected from the Apollo mission are the Mare basalts. These should be more familiar to all of you here. These are just lava flows, which, such as the lava flows you find in Hawaii, uh, though they have slightly different compositions. Uh, they in particular span a large range of abundances of aluminum and also titanium. Uh, the, these rocks here are believed to be derived from, or, from depths about 500 kilometers below the surface of the moon. So this corresponds to melting the upper one-third of the lunar mantle in order to, to generate these rocks. Um, in terms of the ages, there's, there's a large range of ages. The oldest one that's been dated by radiometric means is about 4.2 billion years old. And there's probably older rocks on the surface. It's just we've only sampled about 10 locations on the moon's surface. So uh, these rocks, uh, the, the moon began to partially melt roughly 100 million years or so after the moon was formed. And as, as I'll show later, uh, based on the method of crater counting, we know that the youngest rocks erupted on the moon's surface about 1 billion years ago. Now, this is extremely young for, <laughs> for planetary geologists. So within, the, actually, when you add the error bar onto this, the, the youngest uh, 
basalt that erupted on the moon could have erupted during the time of the Cambrian explosion on the Earth. So what do we know about the distribution of the Mari basalts on the moon? Well, this is a picture that should be familiar to everyone, at least the left side of this. Uh, this, is showing, this is showing an, an optical image taken of the moon. And just to remind you, like these white regions here, these are the highlands of the moon. This is where all the North Acidic rocks are. And these black regions, these correspond to the Mari basalts. These are just flood basaltic lava plains that erupted between about 4 and 1 billion years ago on the moon's surface. Uh, the largest expanse of Mari basalts are located in this region here, Oceanus Procolarum. And some, most of the other lava flows erupted on the near side in these, these, um, in these giant impact basins. So the important point that um, you should take away from this plot is, is two things. First of all, only about 16% of the moon's surface area is covered by Mari basalts, but almost all of the Mari basalts erupted on the near side hemisphere of the moon. There's very few lava flows on the far side. Uh, for instance, there's a crater here that's filled by lava flow. Here's one here. And, and if you look in this, this giant impact basin, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes, uh, there's a few lava ponds in here, but, but they're, not very, they're not very significant. So for some reason, almost all the lava flows erupted on the near side of the moon. And the question is always, why is that the case? Uh, first of all, there's a couple simplistic explanations which are, turn out to be wrong. People sometimes think that the Earth's gravity kind of pulled these things towards the, towards the near side hemisphere of the moon. Uh, but that doesn't work because tidal force is the, it's a degree two phenomenon. So there's equal force operating this way as that way. And these people forget to take into account the centri centrifugal force. But also, in terms of the topography, um, well, I don't want to talk about this too much, but the lowest topography on the moon is here. So if topography is the, is the primary factor controlling eruption of basalts, you would, you would have expected this region here to be entirely, entirely flooded, which it's not. So the, the primary explanation for how these basalts erupted on the near side is that they're somehow related to the distribution of heat production on the moon's surface. So this is, again, just showing the abundance of thorium on the moon's surface, showing that there's this hot spot on, on the near side hemisphere. So this is pretty much where almost all the moon's heat production is located. And this is all the radioactive elements, such as thorium, uranium, and potassium. And this is just showing some results from a piece of work that I did a few years ago. And it shows that if you actually put a thick layer of creep just below the crust in this, in this region right here, that it's actually possible to heat the underlying ma uh, mantle and actually melt it. And these, these curves here are just showing the, the regions of the moon's mantle that are actually melted as a function of time. So it just shows that if, if you have high abundance of heat production at the surface, that you can actually melt the underlying surface, giving rise to the Mari basalts. And you can, you can account for, the, uh, for the, the, the large range of ages of the Mari basalts. In this model here, melting occurs you know, roughly 4.5 billion years ago. And actually, in this model here, melting continues up until the present day. OK, so, the, um, so the, big, the big question that everyone always asks is, how come creep became concentrated in this one small region? And I have to say that this is a question that is not well resolved. There's, there's only a few papers that have been written on the subject. And each, each model is somewhat controversial. So I'm just going to show one model just to give you an idea of the things that people are talking about. But this is just showing, um, this is one hypothesis for concentrating creep on one hemisphere of the moon. And the idea starts with the following. Um, this is showing the density profile of the moon's mantle. Just, uh, so it's de this is the radius of the moon. So this, this is the surface. And then this is density. So more dense stuff over here and less dense stuff over here. And this red curve is showing the predicted density just after magma ocean crystallization. So the, what it shows is that you have lo less dense materials at the base of the magma ocean, because these, these are correspond to magnesium-rich uh, compositions. And as you go closer to the surface, these materials become more iron-rich, so they become more dense. And then the last things that crystallize out are these dense iron-titanium-rich uh, cumulates. So everyone should realize that this is a gravitationally unstable situation. You have dense things on top of light things. And since the moon is hot, uh, you'd expect that this would kind of overturn and achieve some kind of gravitational st stability. So these authors, uh, Parmentier and Hess, have suggested that, in fact, this material here will sink, and then this light material will rise. And it turns out that if you choose your geophysical parameters uh, correctly, <laughs> in, in essence, if you choose the right viscosity for this ilmenite ray layer here and the viscosity for the mantle, it's possible that you can get all these ilmenite-rich cumulates to to downwell in a single hemispheric 
anti-plume, in essence. So, in essence, all this, this ilmenite rich material could concentrate in one hemisphere of the moon, and if you continued to run the simulation, they would eventually sink in, in one hemisphere. And this is one possible manner in which you could concentrate creep on, on one hemisphere of the moon. Now, I should say that this is a somewhat controversial model, and it's as in all geophysical models, there's a, there's a number of parameters that you can play with in order to make this happen or not. So, in order to make this happen, you, you have to choose very specific uh, values for the viscosity of these two layers, and it's not clear whether these values that this, these authors have chosen are realistic or not. But in any case, this is one of the, the ma um, major unknowns about the thermal evolution of the moon, is how creep became concentrated on the near-side hemisphere, and this is just one possible explanation for that. Okay, the last type of rock that was collected on the lunar surface is called a breccia. This is, um, in essence, these are just mixtures of rocks that have been broken up and relithified by impact processes. So this is just showing here. So you have, you have just broken up rocks here that are all just assembled together kind of randomly. Uh, importantly, because these, are, these rocks are formed by impact processes, uh, these rocks contain large quantities of, of impact melt. And actually, in this, this, this uh, image here, these dark regions are, are impact melts, I believe. Also, what's important to realize is when you, take a, when you pick up a breccia on the moon's surface, such as this, you don't know where these, the, these components of this, of this rock originally came from. It's quite possible that most, most of these rocks, most of these um, components in this rock came from the region that you, that you picked it up from. But it's also possible that some of these rocks could have came from thousands of kilometers away. Because if you have an impact on the moon, you, form, you throw material out over the surface for hundreds of thousand kilometers. Some of it will land at this site and then become incorporated into this rock. So whenever you pick any rock up on the lunar surface, it's very difficult to tell where every single class and every single mineral came from. You would hope that every, most, of these, most of the material here came from the region where you actually picked it up, but you're, you can't be certain. And also what you should also realize is that almost every single rock that we, was collected on the moon's surface is a breccia in some sense. Every rock has been affected by impact processes. Every rock has been broken up, um, shocked, and, and, and in some senses uh, relithified by impact processes. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is, um, in this first part of my, my talk, I just kind of talked about the origin of the moon and the rocks that were collected on the surface and some of the geochemical data that was, has been ten, obtained from orbit. Uh, what, I'd like, what I'd like to do now is try to talk about things that are more in the interior of the moon. And in order to do that, we need, we need to use geophysical instrumentation. And the moon turns out to be a very unique object in the solar system in that it's the only uh, planetary body for which we have put in situ geophysical experiments on its surface, uh, with the exclusion of the Earth, of course. Um, so, for instance, um, during the Apollo era, we put uh, these, as I, I'll talk about more in a second, uh, there was a, a geophysical network called ALSEP, which is the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, which had uh, seismometers, heat flow experiments, um, magnetometers, and so, and so on. And the Moon is the only object for which we have these types of data. Uh, people, if you read the literature about Mars or about Venus or Mercury, they, they always, there are lots of people that are trying to infer what's going on inside of these planets. But, but for people who study Mars, they, they don't have any data to work with, or they have very, very little data. Uh, at least with the Moon, we have a large number of data sets, and we can actually say something rather quantitative. <clears throat> okay, so the first piece of geophysical data that we have about the Moon is actually the topography of the Moon, just it's the shape. And this is obtained from laser altimeters, which were flown around the Moon during mostly during the Clementine mission, although there will be several missions in the future that will redo this to, to much higher precision. And what this shows is, well, first of all, I should say that the topography on the Earth is primarily caused by plate tectonic activity. So you have uh, ridges in the, in, the, in the central portions of, of, of oceanic basins, and you have mountain ranges where you have subduction zones. Uh, there's no subduction or no plate tectonics occurring on the Moon whatsoever. The, pretty much the primary process that has modified the shape of the Moon is impact cratering. So you see all these, these large circular depressions. These are just the holes that are left over after an asteroid or a comet smashed into the Moon's surface at several kilometers per second, forming an explosion and digging a hole. So this is an example. Here's the Imbrium Basin. You see a slight topic, topographic depression. depression. Here's the Serenitatis Basin next to it, Chrysium Nectaris. 
Uh, on the far side of the moon, you see this giant hole. This is uh, referred to as the South Pole Aiken Impact Basin. And this turns out to be the largest impact basin that's been recognized in our solar system. So it's, this is huge. It's about 2,000 kilometers across. It's about 8 kilometers deep in the center, and the highest mountains just north of the basin are about 8 kilometers in elevation as well. So there's about 16 kilometers in elevation between the, the deepest portion in this basin and the highest mountains just north of it. Okay, another piece of geophysical data that we have about the moon is the gravity field. Um, the gravity, I'm not going to show any equations in this talk, fortunately for you, um, but the gravity field is just a reflection of Newton's law of gravitation. So whenever you have uh, an excess of mass on the surface, such as a dense lava flow that erupted on the surface or some kind of mountain, that gives this extra mass gives rise to a slight enhancement in the, the local gravitational field of the planet. And you can actually measure these, these local gravitational perturbations from orbit. So this is just showing a map of the gravity field that was obtained during the Lunar Prospector mission in 1998. And what this shows, first of all, is that, well, here's the near side, this is the far side. It shows that the largest gravitational anomalies are usually associated with these giant impact basins. And these are referred to as mass cons, just as a short for mass concentration. Uh, so most of these impact basins here have, so here's Imbrium and has a large uh, gravitational positive gravitational acceleration associated with it. Um, most of these impact basins have been flooded by lava flows. So it's been commonly assumed in the literature that it's the lava flows themselves which are giving rise to these, these uh, excess gravitational anomalies. However, it turns out that there are some impact basins, uh, these ones that are just circled here, they're, they're somewhat smaller, but they do have positive gravitational accelerations in their interior, but they do not appear to be associated with any amount of lava floating. So the, the general idea now about how you form these mass con basins is that the, when, you, when there, these basins are flooded by Mari basalts, that accounts for some of the gravitational uh, acceleration that you see on the surface, but you also need some other process to account for the rest of it for these other basins which don't have lava flows. And the main idea behind this is that there's some kind of variation in, in the interior of the, of the moon, and the most likely part, uh, the most plausible uh, explanation is that there are variations in crustal thickness beneath, beneath these impact basins. So this is just showing an example of a crustal thickness map of the moon. Um, the, the way you, do, you construct this is very simple. Um, first of all, you know what the observed gravitational acceleration of the moon is. The next thing you do is you calculate the gravity field that results from the topography. Uh, the, you subtract this from the observed gravitational field, and then whatever left over you say that that is a result of variations in the crust-mantle interface. So, this, so it's from, from doing this, this kind of geophysical modeling, it's very easy to make a crustal thickness map of the moon. And what this shows is several things. Um, first of all, that it shouldn't be too much surprising, but the crust is predicted to be very thin beneath these giant impact basins. Uh, this is just a fact of relate because you have a... When you form these impact basins, in essence, it's just an asteroid smashes into the moon's surface and it's a giant explosion and you dig a big hole and you thin the crust in the process. So it's just showing that the crust, in this model here, the average thickness of the crust is about 40 or 50 kilometers, but the crust beneath this, this impact basin here is only about 10 kilometers thick. Um, in some basins, such as the Crisium Basin here and the Oriental Basin here, uh, this model actually predicts that the crustal thickness is close to zero. So it's possible on the moon that that the mantle was actually excavated during these impact events, and it's possible that we might be able to find samples of the mantle in the moon's sample collection. Also, with the South Lake and Basin here, the crust is predicted to be very thin, but there's still this model predicts that there should be about 10 or 15 kilometers of crust still present in this basin. Okay, the next piece of, of geophysical data we have for the moon is seismology. Um, in essence, during the, during the Apollo missions, during the Apollo 12, 14, 15, and 16 missions, uh, they, seismometers were placed on the lunar surface as part of this uh, geophysical experiment package called ALSEP for Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package. Uh, these seismometers, were, had, they operated concurrently from when they were turned on, roughly in about 1972, to when they were turned off in about 1977. Now, the unfortunate aspect about the ALSEP experiment is that there's only four seismometers on the moon's surface, uh, which is shown in this, this image here. 
two of them are very close to each other, so this really counts as one seismometer. So in essence, we, this, we have a geophysical network of seismometers, which is in essence a triangle on the moon's surface, and there's roughly about 1,000 kilometers of separation between each vertex of this triangle. So whenever we do look at these geophysical data, for the seismic data, we have to uh, realize that we're only studying a small portion of the moon directly beneath this, this network here, and that we don't have any uh, seismic data available from the far side of the moon. So, uh, it's, it's, so we're very limited in what we can actually say about the interior structure of the moon from the current available data. Uh, this just shows some of, the, some of the aspects of the moonquakes that were detected. In essence, there are four different types of moonquakes. The, the first one are, is actually an external uh, event. There are meteoroid impacts. These are just like small asteroidal or cometary objects which smashed into the moon's surface. Uh, we detected about 1,700 of these uh, during the roughly five to seven years of operation of the seismic experiment. Uh, we also detected nine artificial impacts. And by artificial, these are just, in essence, when the humans went to the, the moon, they had brought these big rockets with them, and when they left, they, they smashed part, parts of the rockets into the lunar surface. So that we have nine of these artificial impacts of stages of the Apollo, of the Apollo um, Saturn V rockets. Um, in terms of internal events on the moon, we detected uh, 28 shallow tectonic moonquakes. Um, these are somewhat rare. Uh, the, the most energetic had body wave magnitudes up to roughly five or so. And most of these moonquakes are, are thought to come from the upper 100 or 200 kilometers of the lunar mantle. But by far the most uh, numerous type of moonquake that was detected were these deep moonquakes. These occurred about 1,000 kilometers below the surface. Uh, it's more than halfway to the center of the moon. And in particular, what's interesting about these is that, first of all, they're correlated with the tides. So there's periodicities of, that are on the order of one lunar month or on the period, or these other precession uh, periods such as six, nine, or 18.6 years. And also, even though there were 7,000 deep moonquakes, um, all these 7,000 deep moonquakes occurred at 100 discrete regions. So in essence, what this means is that you have about 100 fault planes in the, in the moon, and as the moon goes around the Earth, you just have the, these faults just slip. So there's about 100 fault planes, and these 100 fault planes give rise to all these 7,000 deep moonquakes that were that were detected. Uh, you can't really see this picture. That's okay, but this, this here is just showing the distribution of seismic rays. I apologize, you can't see, see it very well. Uh, but in essence, this is just showing the P wave um, rays on the upper port part of this, this plot and the S, S, ray, S ray waves on the bottom. And even though it's not very clear to see, um, what's, what should be evident is that we don't, that there is a strong bias in, in the location of moonquakes that were detected on the moon surface. In essence, the, there are no deep moonquakes that were detected on the far side of the moon. Almost all the moon, moonquakes, even the the impacts that were detected on the moon's surface, almost all of them were located on the near side hemisphere. And the big question in seismology is whether this is an observational bias or if the far side is actually seismically inactive. And both of these, are, both of these hypotheses are, are, can be defended. Uh, first of all, it's, it's possible since the seismic network was on the, on the near side that it's just not sensitive enough to detect things that happen on the far side. For instance, if you had a moonquake over here, if the moon, if, if, if it, this, uh, the the P and S waves lost energy as they traveled through the central portion of the moon, you wouldn't be able to detect them. It's also possible that the far side of the moon is just inactive. Um, in essence, almost all the moon's Mari basalts erupted on the near side of the moon, so you could postulate that the near side of the moon is just more tectonically active than the far side. But also, in terms of studying the core of the moon, uh, it should be clear that we can't say anything about the core of the moon from seismic data, because none of these seismic rays pass through, through the central portion of the moon. So if you want to understand the core, you have to use uh, different types of data sets. Okay, so this is just showing some of the, some of the results. That, oh, this is a horrible picture. Um, this is just showing some of the results that were obtained from the seismic data concerning the thickness of the crust. And what I just want to point out is that there have been several studies that have looked into this, and every study comes up with a different answer. Uh, the first, the group of the people who looked at these data in the, in, in the 1970s, suggested that these are supposed to be the P, uh, P wave velocity profile. So this is depth, and then this is the, is the velocity on the x-axis. And this original group who analyzed these data suggested that the crust was 60 kilometers thick uh, beneath the, the Apollo 12 and 14 uh, stations. 
then about 30 years ago, or 30, 30 years later, uh, several groups started re-looking at these data using much more sophisticated computer modeling techniques. And both of these groups came up with uh, much thinner values. So there's a group in Denmark by Conan Mosegard, and they suggested that the crust mantle interface is actually located about 38 kilometers below the surface. And in the group in Paris, uh, Philippe Lagnonet, he's suggesting that the crust mantle interface is about 30 kilometers below the surface. So each of these studies, uh, for, it, it should be pointed out that each study used different seismic events, different uh, seismic arrival times, and different analysis techniques. So th this accounts for some of the dispersion between these models. But at the same time, there, <laughs> um, it should be clear that at least these, these newer models here are much thinner than the original value of 60 kilometers that was obtained during the Apollo era. And if you believe Philippe Lagnonet's number, the crust is actually uh, one half as thick as, as was previously believed. Okay, in terms of um, another thing you'd like to use seismolo seismology for is to look for seismic discontinuities and within the mantle. Uh, seismic discontinuities could be a result of phase transitions or could be a result of compositional layering. And again, there have been several studies and, and there's not much consistency between these. Uh, some studies, the original ones and the, and the later one by Philippe Lagnonet, suggested that there might be a seismic discontinuity about 500 kilometers below the surface. And people originally interpreted this as being the depth of the lunar magma ocean itself. Uh, in a later study by Kahn and Mosgaard, they suggested that there was some kind of dis something happening around 550 kilometers below the surface. But then just recently, uh, Kahn et al. did an another inversion using a different uh, slightly different data set and slightly different techniques, and they suggested that the seismic velocity profile of the lunar mantle is actually constant, at least for the, the P waves. The S waves, there might be a discontinuity about 800 kilometers below the surface. So it's not really cl clear using the Apollo seismic data um, what's going on, <laughs> if there's any seismic discontinuities in the lunar mantle or not. And for this reason, we really need to have more seismic data for the, for the moon. In particular, just by using three seismic stations, it's very hard to to, to make a, a, a velocity model. We would ideally like to have about 10 or 20 stations on the moon. And also, if you read the, the terrestrial literature, uh, you'll notice that most of the people who study seismology now, that what they, they do is, is seismic tomo uh, tomography. So they study small variations with respect to these reference models. So the lunar people can't even get the reference model correct. So we really need more seismic data. Okay. Um, well, as I mentioned before, um, seismic data can't say anything about the core of the moon, so we have to use alternative means to study the core. And one of these is by using the technique of lunar laser ranging. And the idea behind this is that during the, the, the Apollo missions, they placed these retro reflectors on the, the surface, and during the, the Russian Luna missions, uh, the, the, they had a, a Lunokhod 1 and Lunokhod 2 rovers. They had a, a laser retro reflector here. And what you do is you just, there's stations on Earth where you just shoot a laser at the moon. It reflects off of these things, and then you detect the signal back on Earth. And then you can, by using the time of travel of this, of this, of this laser light, you can determine how far away this, the Earth station is to these stations on the moon. And if you range to several of these different stations, you can actually reconstruct the orientation of the moon very accurately. And I should say now that the accuracy of these ranges from, from Earth to the moon are on the order of two centimeters. And there's actually a new station that's going to be start ranging to the moon called the Pachi Points, and they have a, an accuracy on the order of millimeters. So th these data are very, very precise. So what type of signals do you see in this, these LLR data? Well, there's two types of signals you see. Well, first of all, this is what you see. This, these are called optical librations, and these are caused by the, uh, as a result of the moon's um, eccentric and inclined orbit. So... In essence, the moon's orbit plane is inclined to the, Earth's, or to the ecliptic plane by about 7 degrees, or about 5 degrees, and this causes the moon to kind of wobble back and forth as it goes around the Earth, at least viewed from, from our perspective. Also, the moon is, has an, a slight eccentricity, so it's, it's, it has, the moon gets closer and farther away, so you can actually see the moon, it kind of comes in and it kind of goes out. So this is the major signal that you see with these LLR data. But it turns out that this, this signal isn't very interesting because Newtonian mechanics explains this very precisely. But what people are, who do these ranges are interested in are called physical librations. And these are smaller signals that you can't see on this, this plot here. And what they are is they're, they're just a result of gravitational torques caused by the Earth on the moon's mantle. And it turns out that if the moon has a, a molten core, 
that in essence you, you put a torque on the, moon, on the moon's mantle, but not on the core itself. So in essence what happens is that the, the mantle and the core of the moon are rotating somewhat separately. So you, you have a small velocity difference between the, the, the core of the moon and the overlying, ma overlying ma solid mantle. And the, the, the velocity difference between the core and the mantle is uh, predicted to be on the order of a couple centimeters per second. And this gives rise to dissipation, and this dissipation is visible in these, these, um, these lunar laser ranging data. So um, the people who do these things, they're, they're pretty convinced that they see these dissipation sign signatures associated with a core. So they, they think that the moon does have a core and that it is actually molten. Um, also, these, these, um, these people see evidence for dissipation in the deep solid portion of the mantle. So this suggests to these people that perhaps the deep portion of the lunar mantle might be very hot, perhaps even partially molten. Okay, another way you can study the moon's core, uh, or perhaps study the moon's core, is by studying the magnetic field of the moon. And this is just showing, uh, this is a very brief slide just to show what the magnetic environment of the moon is. So here we have the Earth here. This is the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic sheath and geomagnetic tail. And this is just showing the orbit of, of the moon. And what this shows is that most of the time the moon is actually in the solar wind. Uh, but, but about two days per, per um, month, the moon passes through the Earth's geomagnetic tail lobe. And, and actually, for making magnetic measurements on the moon's surface, as I'll show in a second, the magnetic magnetizations are very, very weak on the moon. So the best places to make these measurements are when the moon passes into this region here, because this is where the, magnetic, the ambient magnetic field is very quiescent. So this is just showing one of the results that was obtained from the Lunar Prospector electron reflectometer. And this is actually showing the total magnetic field strength on the moon's surface. And there's a couple things I want to point out. Um, first of all, well, this doesn't show the vectorial component, but in any case, the, it, when you look at these data, the moon does not have, does not possess a global dipolar field such as, such as the Earth does. So this immediately suggests that if the moon does have a core, that it's not crystallizing and, and giving rise to an active geodynamo. Also, the, the surface field strengths on the moon are, the, the largest ones of these are about 1,000 times less than those on the Earth. So that while there are magnetizations on the lunar surface, they're very, very weak. Um, also, um, the impact basins appear to have modified the magnetization signature of the lunar surface. So wherever you have an impact basin in general, you have very weak fields. In essence, what happens is that the, the high shock pressures and the high temperatures associated with an impact have kind of demagnetizes the crust where the impact occurs. And this actually happens on Mars as well. So here's the Imbrium impact basin here, and has very, very low magnetic field strengths. Same thing with Serenitatis. Now, the curious aspect of these is that it appears, at least some people believe, that the highest magnetic field strengths on the moon are associated with the antipodes of an impact basin. So this is, so for example, here is the Imbrium Basin. If you look on the other side of the moon, exactly 180 degrees away, which is right here, you have a high magnetic field strength. Here's Serenitatis. The basin has low magnetizations, but near its antipode, you have high magnetic field strengths. Here's the Christian Basin, has very low fields here, but its antipode has large magnetic strengths. An oriental here has low magnetic fields, but its antipode has, has large magnetic field strengths. And now you can debate whether this correlation is, is exact or not, but some people believe that this is what's happening. And the question is, why would the moon's highest magnetizations be located on the, an, on the opposite side of the moon of an impact basin? And this is one, one hypothesis for how you could do this. Um, in essence, what the idea is, is that when you form an impact on the moon's surface, so here's a, this is just a hydrodynamic simulation, you form an impact, and this is just showing the density of the kind of vaporized plasma cloud that is generated during this impact event. This, this plasma cloud of, of vaporized silicon materials, it just expands in free space, it expands around the moon, and after about two hours or so, it um, expands, it con the, the, this, this cloud expands all the way around the moon to the, to the far side of the moon. And... Okay, you can't really see this, <laughs> but I'll try to explain what's happening. Um, in essence, this is just showing what would happen if there was a magnetic field, an ambient magnetic field. So pretend there were magnetic field lines that were just horizontal like this. And this is, this is supposed to be the, the show the expansion of this vapor cloud. And since this vapor cloud is partially ionized, it's a plasma, 
it, what it does is it sweeps up all the ambient magnetic fields, and then it concentrates the magnetic fields near the antipode of the impact basin. So for very short periods of time, about two hours after the impact, it's possible that you could have very, very, very high magnetic field strengths on the opposite end of an impact basin. Okay, so this is just showing what our current uh, under idea of what the interior of the moon looks like based on all these geophysical data I've been talking about. Um, so first of all, this is just this black region here is just showing the crust and just showing how the crust varies in thickness. This is derived from both the seismic and, and the gravity data. So the crust of the moon on average is about 40 kilometers thick, and it's, it's thin beneath some of these giant impact basins, such as the South Pole Aiken Basin over here. Um, in terms of seismolo seismology, this is just showing the relative locations of the four seismometers on the moon's surface. Uh, we've det determined that there are shallow moon quakes that occur in the upper 100 or 200 kilometers of the moon's mantle. And these are very rare. They, only 28 were detected over about a seven-year time period. Uh, this is, there's a po possibility for a seismic discontinuity about 500 kilometers below the surface, but it, this is being debated, so it's not clear if this is real or not, or if it, if it is real, if it goes all the way around the moon or not. There are a large number of deep moon quakes that occur uh, with tidal, tidal periodicities. So these are about 700 to about 1,000 kilometers below the surface. Uh, in terms of the core of the moon, based on the lunar laser ranging data, we think that the moon has a molten core, which is about 350 kilometers in radius, you know, with large error bars associated with this. And if the moon does have a molten core, it's almost positive that it also has a solid inner core, because the, the moon has been cooling over 4 billion years, and some portion of this core must have crystallized out. So the moon probably does have a solid inner core, though its size is totally unconstrained. And also, it's quite possible that this region just above the, the core mantle boundary, um, based on the dissipation that has been detected in the lunar laser ranging data, it's possible that this region, the moon right here, might be partially molten. Or at least there's a large amount of en energy being dissipated in, the, in this region of the, of the moon. So in order... so. What should, another thing should, should be clear from this image here is that there's nothing on the, on the far side of the moon. <laughs> we really don't know anything about the far side. Almost all of our information about the lunar interior comes from the seismic data, and all the seismic data is sensitive mostly to the near side of the moon. So in order to improve this picture, what we need to do is put a global geophysical network on the moon's surface. And by global, I mean we need on the order of 10, at least 10 geophysical stations, and they need to be distribu distributed rather uniformly. So you'd have to put at least five on the near side and five on the far side. So this is something that uh, hopefully um, ESA and NASA will think about doing in the next 10 or 20 years or so. There are a couple of missions planned in, in the next, uh, for, for launch in about 2012, which may have uh, seismometers on board. But these are just, there's one mission run by the Japanese, one mission run by the, the Indians, and one mission run by the Chinese. So this w would add three seismometers to the moon, which is pretty much what we did during Apollo. So what we really need is a concerted effort by, by these space agencies to actually put an active geophysical network, which would, which would be long-lived for on the order of 10 years or so. Okay, so next part of my talk is going to be impact cratering. And this image here shows why we use the moon to study impact cratering because the entire surface of the moon has been totally uh, modified by the impact cratering process. Wherever you look, you see evidence for impact craters. Um, this shows why we can't, or why we don't study impact craters on, on the Earth, or why the Earth is not the best place to study impact craters. This is just showing the distribution of known impact craters on the Earth, and there's currently about 170 of them. Uh, most of these are located within the Precambrian shields. They're somewhat old. They've been modified by erosion, erosional processes, but also been modified by tectonic processes. So most of these craters, especially the, the largest ones, are totally unrecognizable as craters. Uh, they've been, uh, you know, the upper 20 kilometers of this crust has been, been totally eroded, or the cr crater has been smashed together, such as Sudbury, which is on the boundary of two tectonic plates, and it's, it's very complicated. But what's good about the moon is that there, um, there is no weather on the moon, and the, the only the major erosional process on the moon is impact cratering itself. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to describe um, several types of craters going from small sizes to, to large sizes 
just to show the difference in morphology and how things change as, as you get go to larger and larger scales. <clears throat> so first start with these micro craters. Um, the idea for studying this is this, this plot here is just showing the distribution of impact velocities on the moon's surface. So this is just showing the, the, the histogram of, velocity, of, of the impact velocity, so impact velocity on the x-axis and the probability on the y-axis. And it shows that the average impact velocity with the moon of asteroidal materials is on the order of 20 kilometers per second. Um, some of these, this, this distribution goes from roughly about 10 kilometers per second all the way up to about 60 or 70 kilometers per second. So these things, these, the moon is being hit by things that are going very, very fast. Now, on the Earth, uh, we have benefit from the fact that we have an atmosphere, which gives rise to weather. But it also, what it does is it protects us from these, these micrometeorites. Because when you have a micron or a millimeter or even a centimeter-sized object, going 20 kilometers per second through the atmosphere, as a re result of friction, you just burn these objects up. So this is just showing meteors as these objects are burning up in the atmosphere. Now on the Earth, or on the Moon, since there is no atmosphere, these small objects collide into the Moon's surface, and it gives rise to these small little craters. And what the, the important thing to realize is that, first of all, for this is a risk to humans on the Moon's surface, because if you're hit by something that's just a you know, millimeter in diameter, but going 20 kilometers per second, you know, it's going to cause some, some damage, especially if you have a spacesuit on and you have a hole and it gives, you know, so this is something that you have to be, this is a real risk to humans, humans on the surface. Okay, so next crater, let's go to slightly larger sizes. This crater here is about seven kilometers in diameter. Uh, this is just a, a, an example of this simple crater. It's just a, a, in essence, it's just a simple bowl-shaped crater. It has just the shape of a bowl. It has an uplifted crater rim. Um, also, what's kind of visible in this image is that it has a continuous ejecta blanket. So the ejecta is just a material that came out of the center of the material and depo was deposited exterior to the, uh, to the impact crater. So this is, shows that there's a continuous ejecta blanket that's about one crater radius uh, surrounding this, this impact crater. Also, in terms of the depth of this, these craters, the depths are on order about 20% the diameter of the crater. Okay, so the next type of crater are, are referred to as transitional craters. On the moon, these have diameters roughly about 15 kilometers or so in, in diameter. And the big difference between these and the, and the simple bowl-shaped craters is that the floors are, are much flatter than these bowl-shaped craters. Also, um, because the, the crater walls are gravitationally unstable, they have steep angles, um, parts of these walls kind of gravitationally collapse and material slumps into the center of these craters. So here you can kind of see these slump deposits, which are just material that kind of fell off the sides of this rim into the center of the crater. Okay, here's the next example as you go to larger sizes. Uh, they're called complex craters. Uh, this is a, an example of the Euler crater, which is about 28 kilometers in diameter. And there's two things... Um, which make these different than the previous craters. First is that the floors are, are very flat. Um, you can't see this, this diagram at all. Um, it's, in essence, what it's showing is the depth versus diameter. And it just shows that the depth versus diameter craters is, is like this. And then you get to 20 kilometers, and then it's shallower. So there's a, there's a very uh, there's a transition around 20 kilometers on the moon. So this is just showing that the floor of these craters is very flat. The big difference is, is that it actually has a central peak or a central mountain range in the center of this crater. And also, it's kind of hard to see on this, this screen here, but you can also see that the crater wall has been modified by gravitational slumping. So materials have slumped off the side of the crater wall into the center of the crater. Also, what's, you can also, if you look at this close enough, you can actually see that there's a large concentration of small craters surrounding this impact crater here, and these are referred to as secondary craters. These are just material that was ejected from the center of the, of the basin, landed here, and landed at high enough velocities that, should, that you actually created a small secondary impact crater. Okay, so the question is, how do you form these central peaks? And this is the general idea. Um, you can kind of see this. Um, the, the idea is that geologic materials behave as fluids on short time scales when subjected to very, very high stresses. So this is just showing the exa example of the water impact. So you just have an object here which is falling uh, that hits uh, just uh, just some water, and you form a crater 
uh, it's kind of hard to see, but what you should be able to see in these, these later slides is that the actual floor of this, of this water actually rebounds hydrodynamically upward. So this, this is one of the last time steps here, and you should see that there's, after this material hits the, the surface of the water, the, the water kind of rebounds upwards above its initial state. So um, this is the general idea of how central peaks form. It's just a hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic phenomenon. And then after these stresses in the lunar crust uh, uh, decay away, the material behaves as a rock once again. Okay, this is going to bigger craters here. This is an example of the Schrodinger uh, Peak Ring Crater. Uh, the difference between this and central peak craters is that you, never, no, you don't have a central peak in the center, but rather you have a peak ring. Um, also, you can see in the crater wall, this is the crater rim, and you actually can see that, that there are slump deposits where this, the crater wall here is actually slumping in towards the center of the crater. Now, when you go to bigger craters, things get a little more complicated. This is an example of the, the Oriental Impact Basin on the western hemisphere of the moon, and it's called a multi-ring impact basin because it has several ring-like structures. So here's one ring, here's a second one, here's a third one, and fourth one here. And the geologists claim that they can see another one out here as well. Now, it's not clear um, which of these rings here corresponds to the crater rim, nor which one of these crater which one of these rings corresponds to a peak ring, if any of them do. Also, what's somewhat unfortunate about these craters is that there are also many of them are flooded by lava flows. So this obscures the interior structure of these craters as well. But it turns out that one of the best ways to investigate these types of craters are by using geophysical methods. So again, this is just one of these crustal thickness maps that I showed earlier. And by using these crustal thickness maps, you can see that the crust here for this Oriental Basin is very thin. And this is just showing a profile of how, of, here's the surface of, of one crater, and here is, here is a profile of the crust mantle interface, showing that the, that the crust is very thin in the very center of these basins. And by using these kind of maps here, it's possible to make an estimate of the size of these, of these impact craters. And you can also estimate the size of, um, or the depth of excavation of materials. And since we can't see this, I'm not going to discuss it. Uh, but the idea is, is that the, the geologists, when they, they see these multi-ring structures, many of the ge geologists thought that the crater rim was, was, some, was one of these big rims right here. But it turns out when you look at the geophysics that the crater rim is actually one of the smallest rings here. So even though these, these craters are very prominent and they have very visible rings, the size of the actual crater rim itself is much smaller than what the geologists uh, have thought. And this briefly go through this. This is just a summary of how craters form. Um, people do, do types of, these types of models on computers, and they generally break these models up into three steps. Uh, first is the contact and compression stage. This is when actually the asteroid hits the surface, which lasts on the order of a second. It sets up these high pre shock pressures. Uh, the second stage is the excavation of stage, which lasts from seconds to minutes. And this is just this, the shock wave causes materials to kind of move outwards. And then the modification stage is where you actually have the central portion of the, the floor rebounding and the, the walls of the crater um, being modified by gravitational processes. And just briefly, um, this just shows um, from these models what happens. So you have a hole on the moon's surface, and you want to know what happened to the materials that were in that hole. And it just shows the materials that are next to the impact site itself. These are, this material here is vaporized. Uh, just surrounding this, this shows material that was, was melted. And the material that was actually ejected out of the crater, um, forming an ejected blanket, is, is here. And it shows that the depth of excavation is actually very, very shallow compared to the final crater that's formed. So the depth of excavation is on the order of one-tenth of the diameter of the crater. And then this material here, this is not actually ejected. This material here is just kind of displaced downward and outwards. And just briefly, uh, you've all heard about the Martian and, and lunar meteorites. Um, well, this is just showing an example of how you can form these things, is that some of the materials that are ejected off of, of, of the surface of Mars and the Moon are, are ejected at very, very high velocities. Some of them exceed the, the um, escape velocity of the planet. And this is just showing um, some of the, the, the velocity of material that's ejected from an impact crater and event as a function of distance from the center of the crater. Uh, this is for a Mars... Uh, for a Mars uh, impact that's about two kilometers in diameter, I believe. But this shows that all this material here is actually is ejected from the crater at velocities in excess of the escape velocity. 
So all this material will be put in orbit around the sun, and it's possible that over millions of years that actually might, these materials might land on the Earth. Um, it's also possible that uh, we have materials that are ejected from the Earth, which will land on the moon, and there's been a group that studied this problem, and they think it's, it's quite feasible to actually go to the moon and search for terrestrial meteorites. As I mentioned before, this would be very useful because um, some of the oldest rocks that have been dated on the, on the Earth are only on the order of 4 billion years old or so. So it's quite possible that early in the solar system evolution, when uh, impact cratering was a more important process on the, the moon and Earth, that some of these large impact craters about 4.5 billion years ago could have ejected uh, meteorites from the Earth's surface and they could have landed on the moon. And if we can find these, these, these would be a, a very, uh, very interesting samples to study in order to piece together the Hadean evolution, geologic evolution of the Earth. And I don't have time to say anything about that. Okay, um, so next what I'd like to do is show how we can actually use impact craters to date this planetary surfaces. Um, ideally, what we would like to do is we'd send a human or a robot to Mars, pick up a sample, and then bring it back to our lab, and then subject it to radiometric dating techniques. Uh, unfortunately, this has only been done with the moon. Um, so it, this, we have to find other alternative methods for dating planetary surfaces. And this, but what people come up with is, the, is a method called crater, crater counting or crater chronology. And the idea is very simple. Uh, in essence, um, surfaces on planetary bodies accumulate craters at a, a roughly constant rate. And therefore, surfaces that are old will have more craters than surfaces that are young. So in this crater here, this is showing the highlands of the moon, and there's lots of, lots of impact craters found all over this. But you see in these, these lava flows here, there's very, very few impact craters. So this is just a relative indication saying that, that these lava flows must be younger than these highlands here. Um, if you're a geologist, you could also use superposition, superposition re relationships to show that these lava flows overlie the highlands, so they must be younger as well. Okay, so in practice, how do you, how do, you do this? Um, what you do is you get an image of the, of, of, the in, of the geologic unit that you're interested in looking at, and you count the number of craters as a function of diameter, and you create what's called a size frequency diagram. So in essence, this is just showing a plot showing the number of craters as a function of, of diameter here. And what this plot shows is, is three things. It's showing a size frequency diagram for distribution for the Oriental Impact Basin, which is this, this curve number one. Um, for Eratosthenian crater, craters, which are known to be younger than Oriental, this is the second curve. And then this last curve is for Copernican craters, which are known to be younger than Eratosthenian craters. So the first thing that this shows is that all these curves are roughly the same, except that there's a vertical offset between these. And this vertical offset is, a, is an indication of their relative age. And what you would like to do is find a way to, to, to determine, to, to use these curves, to use this relative offset between these curves to actually make an estimate of the absolute age of the crater. And it turns out that you can do this on the moon. And the, the moon is the only place in the solar system where you can do that uh, because... Uh, we have, um, we've actually collected samples with known geologic context. So what we've done is we sent astronauts to a place on the moon. They've collected samples. Uh, they've, we brought these samples back to the Earth, and we've made estimates of the age of the samples. And then with images of these sites, we can actually count the number of craters on these, on these geologic units. So I apologize, this is hard to see, but this is just showing the number of craters um, as a function of, of, of age. And these, these data points here, these are actual calibration points. These are samples that were collected from the moon's surface, and they were dated on the Earth. And then we counted the number of craters that, were, uh, that are on these geologic units just using images of the surface. So by using the lunar data, we can actually calibrate this, this curve. So if we go to somewhere else on the moon's surface and we know that there's, say, 100 craters that are greater than one kilometer, uh, we look on this curve and it shows that it's about 2, two billion years in age. And it's, this is, I apologize, it's kind of hard to see on this, this plot, but this, is just, this plot is here is, is plotted in a, a log scale on the, on the y-axis, whereas this plot is on a linear scale. And what this shows is that the cratering rate is, is thought to be relatively, relatively constant over the past 3.5 billion years. But before that, the cratering rate was much higher. So this is just an example of one of the things you can do with this crater chronology method. Um, there's a group uh, in Germany by, led by Harry Hiesinger, also Harold uh, Malikum, 
where you take pictures of the lunar surface and you count the number of craters on the Mare basalts, and then you can estimate their ages. And this shows that um, some of the oldest basalts that have been dated using this method are about 4 billion years. These are these blue-colored regions. But somewhat surprisingly, some regions of the moon, uh, protect, particularly in this, this region, the, the Oceanus Procolarum region, this is where all the heat-producing elements on the moon are located. In the very center of the Procolarum creep terrain, some of these basalts have very, very young ages, about one billion years old. Uh, this is just showing another thing that you can do. Um, the geologists on the moon, they've constructed a relative geologic time scale that's based on stratigraphic principles, and they've divided the moon's... Uh, geologic time into several time periods, such as the pre-Nectarian, Nectarian, Imbrium, Eratosthenian, and Copernican. Now, th these ages are based entirely, or these units are based entirely on stratigraphic principles. So you can actually use this crater chronology method to assign specific ages to each of, of the, the beginning and end of these geologic periods. So an example, the, form, the Nectaris Basin um, is believed to have formed about 4.1 billion years ago, or perhaps older or younger. Um, the Imbrian Basin is believed to be about 3.9 billion years old. Uh, the Oriental Basin has been estimated to be about 3.8 billion years based on crater counting data. Um, the base of the Eratosthenian peri period is actually based on a, on a certain size of crater that's been degraded beyond a visible, visible uh, view on the, on the moon's surface. And then the Copernican period here is based on the loss of crater rays. Um, Okay, now what I'd like to next point out is that this crater chronology that I've just discussed is very useful and because we can't go to every single location on the moon and obtain samples and then and bring these samples back to the Earth and use radiometric dating to date them. So the, the crater chronology method is very, very, very useful for estimating ages far from the Apollo landing sites. However, there are a large number of uncertainties with, these, with this crater chronology method that you should be aware of. So when people tell you that the age of a certain geologic unit on Mars is 3.2 billion years, you should realize that there is an uncertainty in that number that could be as large as a factor of two. So this is just showing some, some of the errors associated with the, the lunar crater chronology, crater chronology method. Uh, this is just showing three geologic time scales that have been developed by three different groups of researchers, and it's showing that they're slightly different. Um, one of the big differences that's still somewhat unresolved is the age of the Nectaris impact basin, which defines the, um, the Nectaris, in, in, uh, Nectaris impact basin defines the end of the Nectaris, Nectarian period. And some people think that Nectaris formed about 3.9 billion years ago, whereas others think it might have formed about 4.1 billion years ago. Also, the big difference in, in this plot here, it's kind of, I apologize, it's hard to see on, on the screen. Uh, but the base of the Copernican is different in, in, these three different, in these three different geologic time scales. So this is another thing that needs to be taken into account. Um, also, I have a student that's working on a project showing that the cratering, impact cratering rate on the moon's surface is actually not uniform everywhere. And the idea for this is, is twofold. Um, in essence, the moon is in synchronous rotation so that we only see one hemisphere of the moon at a time. So the moon is kind of just going around the Earth like this. And in essence, more impacts occur on the leading hemisphere of the moon, just as if you're driving a car in the rain and you have more um, impacts of water on the windshield of the front of your car as opposed to the back of the car. So this model predicts that there should be about 20% more impacts occurring on the, the, the leading hemisphere of the moon as opposed to the trailing hemisphere. Also, there's more impacts that occur near the equator than near the, near the poles of the moon. And this is just a reflection of the fact that most of the near-Earth asteroids are actually... Um, their inclinations are not randomly distributed, but rather most of the inclinations of the near-Earth asteroids are close to the ecliptic plane. So it just turns out that more impacts occur near the equator than near the pole based on geometric reasons. But in any case, um, this just shows that the, the variation in the moon's cratering rate varies by a factor about 40% from, from this region here to this region here. So this is another thing that needs to be taken into account when you, when you do a precise crater chronology of the moon. Uh, another thing you'd like to do is try to estimate the ages of geologic units on other planets using the similar crater chronology method. And what you need to do is, is nest and create, uh, you need to convert the moon's cratering rate to a cratering rate on another planet. And in order to do this, you need several parameters. The first one is, this is just showing this equation here. The first one is you need to know the, know the relative flux of objects that are impacting the two bodies. This is quantified by this, quant this 
parameter here, Rb, which is our bolide. Uh, you need to know the surface gravity of the two planets. And that's easy to know. And you also need to know the average impact velocity of, the, of these asteroids and comets on the two, in, on the two bodies. Now, it turns out that estimating the relative flux of impacts, objects impacting two bodies is not very easy to do, uh, nor is estimating the average impact velocity of, of asteroids on other planets, such as Mercury and Venus and Mars. And the way, you most like, the way that people do this is by using models of the orbital, orbital elements of the asteroids, and then they can ask, from using these models of the orbital elements, they can estimate uh, the velocity that these objects will smash into other planets. But I, it's important to point out that these are all, that when you estimate RB or when you estimate the average impact velocity, these are based on models and it's not based on observations. And se several of the late, leading crater chronologists, they often cite um, that there should, at least when you're studying the crater chronology of Mars, there's a potential factor of two error in the crater chronology method. So this means that if you have a, a, a site on the surface of Mars that's three, 3 billion years old, it could be 1.5 billion years old, or it could be 6 billion years. So this is, you know, this is a large uncertainty, and this is something that needs to be addressed. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about in terms of impact cratering is what's called the lunar cataclysm, or the late heavy bombardment, and you'll hear more about this uh, this afternoon. This is another um, source of uncertainty with the lunar crater chronology. Um, and also the crater chronology of the other planets as well. But the idea is, is the following. Um, you'd expect, this is just showing the, the relative impact rate occurring on the moon as a function of time. So here is when the moon formed. It's, now, it's logical to suppose that the moon's crater rate was higher in the past and then it kind of slowly de declined with time. And at the present time, it's, uh, and the moon's crater rate has been relatively constant over the past three billion years. However, there's a group of people that think that they're, that, there was actually the crater rate declined, but then there was a small period around 3.9 billion years ago when there was actually a temporary increase in the cratering rate, and then this cratering rate uh, decayed down very rapidly. So there's this, there's this, yeah, this continuous decline in the cratering rate of the of the Earth Moon system, and then there's a spike superimposed at 3.9 billion years. Now this is kind of crazy. Um, some people believe it, some people don't. But the question is, why would someone think that there is a spike in the cratering record at 3.9 billion years? And the, the way this came about is, relates to how you actually measure the age of an impact basin on the moon's surface. So just an example, um, this is showing here, this is a, a breccia coming from the Apollo 16 site. So what most people assume when you pick a rock up on the, on the moon's surface is that this rock came from the nearest uh, large impact basin. So Apollo 16 is very close to the Nectaris impact basin. So most people assumed that this, most, of these, most of this rock is composed of materials that came out of the Nectaris impact basin. In particular, um, these dark regions here, these are impact melts, which are, these are rocks that were probably melted during these giant impact events. And most people assume that since Apollo 16 is close to Nectaris, that these impact melts here are impact melts from the Nectaris impact basin. It seems very logical. And it's very easy to date these impact melts, so that, that could give you an age of the Nectaris impact basin. Okay, so this is just showing what we know about the ages of, of lunar craters. First of all, this is just showing a list of craters arranged in chronological order. Uh, this is based on superposition relationships uh, obtained by, by geologic means. And first of all, it shows, so with the youngest impact basin based on superposition relationships is Oriental, and the oldest one I show in this plot is Nectaris. There's also 28 larger impact basins, which I'm not going to talk about. But um, so some people think that the Nectaris impact basin, based on dating samples from the Apollo 16 site, uh, is about 3.89 or 3.9 billion years old. We have samples from the Chrysium basin from the Russian uh, Luna 24 mission. Uh, so we believe, based on these samples, that the age of Chrysium is about 3.89 billion years. Uh, Serenitatis, we have samples from the Apollo 17 site over here. Uh, so we believe that the Serenitatis impact basin is 3.89 billion years old. From the Imbrium basin, we have samples from the Apollo 15, but also the Apollo uh, 12 and 14 sites over here. And we believe that the, Apollo, that the Imbrium impact basin is 3.85 billion years old. And some people think that Oriental is about 3.85 billion years old based on crater chronology method. So what this shows 
is that if these dates are correct, is that 15 giant impact basins could have formed on the moon's surface in a very short period of time of only about 60 million years. So this is a very, very high cratering rates where you just, 60 million years in geologic history is nothing. So just imagine 15 giant, imagine every single giant impact basin that you can see on the, on the moon's surface forming at roughly the same time. So this is the idea of the cataclysm. However, there, there is an alternative possibility to the cataclysm hypothesis, and this is, the, the idea is the following. Um, in essence, people believe that all, the reason that all these ages are the same is that we're actually dating the same event. So there's one group of people that think that all these samples that were collected on the moon's surface here actually came from the Imbrium impact basin, and that's why they all have the same age, because it's just dating the age of the Imbrium. Now, why would they say this? Um, well, the rationale is that Imbrium is, first of all, the largest impact basin on the near side hemisphere of the moon, and it's also the, the, one of the youngest impact basins. So the material that came out of Imbrium would be very close to the surface. Um, also, based on modeling of the ejecta of this impact basin, just showing two curves here, uh, this is just showing the, the entire the ejecta deposit thickness of the Imbrium basin as a, function of, of dia, uh, as a function of distance away from the crater. This is showing the Apollo 16 site here. And what this shows is that at the Apollo 16 site, that the upper one kilometer of the surface would have been modified by material coming out of the Imbrium impact event. Now, by modified, I mean uh, the addition of, of primary material onto the surface plus just mixing up uh, local materials, forming what's called secondary ejecta. Um, also, based on this curve here, this is showing the percentage of Imbrium material in this mixed zone. And it shows that of this upper one kilometer material at the Apollo 16 site, about 20% of the material in that deposit could have been derived from the Imbrium impact event. Now also, um, what's important to realize is that the volume of impact melt scales as a factor of crater diameter to 3.85 power. Now what this means is that the larger the impact basin is, that the largest impact basins are going to generate a large amount of impact melt, whereas small craters will generate small amounts of impact melt. So what this suggests is that since Imbrium is the largest impact basin on the near side, Imbrium will generate the largest amount of impact melt, and therefore you might have about 20% of impact melt in the materials at the Apollo 16 site. So when you look at this picture again, you pick this up at the Apollo 16 site. Now how do you know that this impact melt here came from Nectaris? Because there's these people who work with the imp uh, modeling the, 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 the uh, thickness of ejecta deposits and how much Imbrium material is at the Apollo 16 site, and they're saying that the entire Apollo 16 site has been modified by the Imbrium event and that 20% of the materials on the surface might be, imp might be from Imbrium. And not only that, but most of the material from the imp Imbrium impact event will be impact melt, just because it's such a big crater and it, has such, it gives off such amount of energy when, when you form a crater. So how do you know that these, these, these impact melts here are from Nectaris? They could easily be from Imbrium. It's, you know, it, you can't, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say. Some of these could be from Nectaris, some of them could be from Imbrium, who knows. So, so this is an alternative hypothesis to the cataclysm. This, what some people might call this cataclysm light. Um, in essence, you don't change the ages of, of Imbrium or Serenitas or Chrysium, though you could if you wanted to. But some people think that the Asian Nectaris Basin might actually be much older. So, in essence, what people do is they take these, these, uh, they take these samples here and they get rid of all the all the samples that are 3.85 billion years old, and they see what's left. And then there's a, there's a peak in the age distribution of about 4.1 billion years old. So, some people think that Nectaris might be about 4.1 billion years old. Also, Oriental. This is we don't actually have samples from Oriental, but based on cratering. A chronology method plus this um, this asymmetric distribution of cratering across the lunar surface I was just talking about the oriental impact basin could be as young as 3.69 billion years old could be so what this means is that if you believe these two revised ages here is that 15 giant impact basins might have formed in 400 million years as opposed to 60 million years so this is a this is a big difference this is a factor of 10 difference in the cratering flux on the moon's surface So how can we, can we test uh, these two hypotheses? Um, it's very hard to do. Um, first of all, this is just showing the dis histogram of impact melt ages obtained from the Apollo and Luna samples. It's kind of hard to see, but you should see that there's a peak in this hist hist 
in this distribution around 3.9, 4 billion years, years ago. So what people have done is they've, they've tried to find samples that have come from regions far away from, from the near side of the moon. And what people have done is, is looked at uh, impact melts inside of the lunar meteorites. So lunar meteorites are samples of the moon that we don't know where they come from. They come from random locations around the moon. But roughly half of the lunar meteorites should come from the far side hemisphere of the moon. So these people have, found, have looked at the lunar meteorites, chosen which ones they think probably come from the far side, had measured the ages of, of impact melts that are inside of these, and came up with the following histogram of ages. And I apologize, you can't see this very well. But what it shows is that the hist there's a histogram of ages. There is no peak. There, there seems to be a relatively uniform histogram of ages between about 4.1 billion years and 2.5 billion years. So what this could suggest to some people is that there's no peak in the impact crater and rate around 4.4 billion years or 3.9 billion years. But at the same time, they, they don't find any impact melts that are older than 4.1 billion years old, which is very curious. So some people might say that, well, this, the reason there's no impact melts that are older is because there weren't any giant impact basins forming then. They all formed at 4.1 billion years, years ago. And this is very controversial, and it's, it's really in, difficult to interpret these data. And each side of this cataclysm debate uses the same figure here to support their, their position. <laughs> so how, how can we test this hypothesis in the future? Uh, it's, it's, very, it's going to be very hard to do. And, but in essence, what we will need are, are more samples from the moon at, at controlled locations. Because with the lunar meteorites, we really don't know where they came from. Although most of them probably came from the far, half of them probably came from the far side. And I'm not going to say too much about this because you're going to see this this afternoon. But the question is, if there was a cataclysm, how could you form a cataclysm? How could you form a, 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 a spike in the cratering rate 3.9 billion years ago? Well, there are several hypotheses. One is that a star passed close to the Earth and dislodged lots of materials from the Oort cloud, and these objects smashed into the inner solar system. Another possibility is that there might have been a fifth planet so, uh, close to the asteroid belt. Um, and in this hypothesis here is showing that, the, that the, um, there could have been a migration of the, the giant planets. So in essence, you start out with a, a large amount of... Um, of small cometary objects here. The orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they change very rapidly as they go through a mean motion resonance. And when this happens, so everything kind of, as, as the orbits of, of Uranus and Neptune change, all these, these cometary objects here are kind of dispersed. And some of these are likely to, to have collided with the inner portion of the solar system. And it's possible that this could be the, the cause of the lunar cataclysm, if there was a cataclysm. OK, I'm briefly just going to talk now about the possibility of ice on the moon. This is perhaps more, of more interest to the exobiologists here. And the reason ice and volatiles on the moon are important is because it's important for human activities. Um, you, need, you need to have air to live on the, on the moon. You also need to have water to grow plants. And also, in order to get to the moon and back, you have to have rocket fuel. So if you have a source of water or ice, you, you could, per, per, could potentially make all three of these things. So why, is there, why would we expect to find ice at the poles of the moon? It's, this is related to the orbital geometry of the Earth-Moon system. So this is just showing the sun is over here. Here's the Earth. Here's the moon. It just shows that, the um, first of all, the, ori the orbit of the moon is, is inclined by 5 degrees to the ecliptic. And the, the, the inclination of the moon's spin axis to the ecliptic is about 1.5 degrees. So it's practically zero. So the moon's spin axis is nearly perpendicular to its orbital plane and the orbit plane of the Earth. And what this means is that radiation from the sun is going to be nearly perpendicular, is going to be nearly parallel to the surface at the poles. So if for some reason you had a small indentation at the pole, such as by an impact crater, uh, it's possible that sunlight might never fall inside of this crater, just because the solar radiation is going to be is going to be parallel to the surface like this. And it's also, I should point out that this this current um, orbital geometry has been has been pretty stable over the past three and a half billion years. So it's if there are um, if it turns out that there is ice in the poles of the moon, this ice could be very old, up to about three billion years old or so. 
Okay, so how do you determine regions that never receive sunlight on the moon's surface? And the way you do this is that you actually just take pictures of the moon's surface. And if there's, if there's regions of the moon that are always black, that means that the sunlight's not falling there. So this is what they did with the Clementine images uh, during the Clementine mission in 1994. And this map here is just showing the percentage of the surface that it, the percentage, percentage of time that the surface is, is illuminated by solar radiation. So whenever you see these, these, um, these bright colors of red and white, uh, this means that the surface is, to is illuminated by the sun all the time. And whenever you see these regions that are dark, such as in this crater here and that crater there, that means that these regions never receive any sunlight. So at the North Pole, there's two potential craters where there's no sunlight ever falls. The same thing happens at the South Pole. Uh, there's a couple of big craters here. Um, but what I should, should point out is that the orbital geometry of the moon changes slowly over an 18.6 year time period. Because I mentioned that the orbit plane of the moon is inclined by, by five degrees, but this plane rotates with precesses with, with a period of about 18.6 years. So it's not clear if these regions are always per in permanently shadow. So we need more images over longer time periods to see if this is, if this is the case. But these are um, prime places to look for the presence of volatiles on the moon. Now, how do you um, actually trap volatiles near the poles of the moon? Well, what happens is, in essence, you have a cometary impact or an impact of a water-rich uh, carbonaceous asteroid or something like that. And you, this water that's in it is kind of just ballistically ejected from the moon's surface. Uh, since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, these water molecules are set off on ballistic trajectories, and they kind of hop around the lunar surface until they uh, end up somewhere such as at the pole, where the temperature is very cold, and they're actually trapped for a long period of time. Or perhaps these things, these, these molecules are eventually uh, ejected into space. And this is just showing an example of the temperature of one of these permanently shadowed craters on the moon, and just shows that there are certain regions over here where the temperatures never drop and never go above 50 Kelvin. So these regions are very, very cold. So if a water molecule ends up in this region here, once it gets there, it's not going to have any, it's not going to want to move anywhere. Okay, so how do you, is there any evidence for hydrogen at the pole? Uh, I'm just going to give you two pieces of evidence. The first one concerns neutron spectroscopy. And the rationale behind this is that you have cosmic rays which collide into the moon's surface, and they give off a large number of high-energy neutrons in the upper meter of the, of the regolith. And if there happens to be a life element such as hydrogen, um, these... The, these, this will moderate these neutrons to lower and lower energies. And the reason is, is that if you have a neutron that smashes into a big element like, like iron, it just is reflected back with exactly the same speed. But if, it's, if it collides with a small element such as hydrogen, it loses half of its energy in the process. So the energy of the, of the ballistically um, bounced off molecule will have half the energy as before. And this makes it, the neutrons go to lower and lower energies. And you can't see this figure here, but all it shows is that the energy distribution of these neutrons depends on how much water is in the surface. So if you have 0% water, you have lots of fast neutrons over here, whereas if there's lots of water, the neutrons, uh, there's only the energy of the fast neutrons is much lower. So these, um, this is just showing a picture that has been obtained from the, from the lunar prospector gamma ray neutron experiment. And wherever you have high, high colors here, this corresponds to high abundances of hydrogen. And what this shows is um, a couple things. Um, first of all, that there is appears to be an enhancement of hydrogen near both the North and South Pole, though these maps don't have a very high spatial, spatial resolution. But these high abundances of hydrogen do appear to be correlated with the locations of these permanently shadowed craters. In some of these regions, the highest abundance of, of water, if you presume this, this, this hydrogen is in the form of ice, then there's about 0.17 weight percent um, water ice in these, these regions here. But the big question is, what, what is the form of this hydrogen? Is it is in the form of water ice, or is it just implanted solar wind, or is it hydrated minerals? And this, the, the neutron data can't address. Um, there's also evidence for ice uh, near the poles of the moon using radar experiments. Um, this image is probably easier to, to interpret. This is actually from Mercury. But it just shows that near the pole of Mercury, you have these anomalous radar reflections, and this has been interpreted as the presence of volatiles. And you do the same experiment with the moon, though I don't have a nice picture to show. And it shows that you have this anomalous radar signature near the poles of the moon, though the interpretation of this is somewhat debated. 
some people, for instance, this crater here, these are data for a crater in a permanently shadowed region, and this is a, for a crater in sunlight, and these, both of these craters have the same radar signature. So some people suggest that the radar signature is not indicative of ice, but that could be a result of something else, such as uh, surface roughness. And I'm just going to, what are the possible sources of polar hydrogen? Well, there's a number of possibilities. It could be solar wind, comets, uh, et cetera. And since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to close. Um, this, my, my final slide is just to show that there's going to be a, a large amount of, there's a large number of spacecraft that are going to the moon in the next several years. And this is just kind of a timeline of things which is hard to read. It's very easy to see on my screen. Um, first of all, in this last year, there were two spacecraft that were launched to the moon. Uh, one is called Selene, or Kaguya. It's a Japanese mission, which is currently in orbit around the moon. And they're going to be making images of the lunar surface. They have a laser altimeter on board. They're going to be make, making a gravity map. Uh, they're going to be doing lots of things. They have a radar on board to measure the thickness of Mari basalts. A uh, mission was also launched the same year by the Chinese, called Cheng'e-1. And there's a large number of instruments on board as well, although the Chinese aren't as open with their data, so no one really knows what they're, what they're doing. Um, this year here, there, there's going to be two launches uh, to the moon. One is the Chandrayaan-1 mission, which is an Indian mission, but there's a lot, they have a large contribution of instruments from both ESA and from the United States. Um, also, at the end of the year, NASA is going to be launching Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and this is in order to map the the surface of the moon to very high spatial resolution so that when astronauts go back, they can know where every single rock is on the lunar surface, in essence. Uh, in about 2011, there will be a mission called GRAIL. This is a, a mission similar to the mission called GRACE, which is in orbit around the Earth now. And this is going to make a very high-precision gravity map of the lunar surface. And then roughly in, in the time frame of 2012 or so, there are several missions that will most likely land on the lunar surface. Um, there's the Selene 2. It's a Japanese mission which will, which will land on the surface, which will have at least a seismometer on board and, most, and possibly a heat flow probe. Um, the Chinese also have a, have a plan to put a lander on the surface as well, but no one knows what's going to be the payload. Um, the Indians, they want to have a Ch Chandrayaan 2 mission, which will, which will land on the surface, but again, in this case, the payload hasn't been defined yet. And also, the, uh, with the Europeans, uh, uh, ESA Space Agency, uh, ESA is in the process of trying to select between two potential missions, one called Moon Next and the other Mars Next, and hopefully we'll know which one they will decide in, in the next year or two. So um, just to conclude, um, if you're interested in the Moon, there's a review book that just came out about a year ago uh, with um, six huge review chapters. So this, this book has everything you want to know about the Moon in it, though it might take you several years to read it. But if, you, if you're looking for more information, this is where you should go. And thank you for paying attention.